please be aware that during the transfer and introduction, your lines are open. Anything you say will be heard in the conference. And also, I'd just like to remind everyone to stay on the line once the conference has ended, and I'll transfer everybody back into this room. One moment, please. I got it. Yeah. Good afternoon. My name is Sally, and I'll be your conference operator today. At this time, I would like to welcome everyone to the Midwest and Great Plains Drought Webinar. All lines have been placed on mute to prevent any background noise. After the speaker's remarks, there will be a question and answer session. If you would like to ask a question during this time, simply press star, then the number one on your telephone keypad. If you would like to withdraw your question, press the pound key. Thank you. John Ives, Climate Services Manager for the National Weather Service. You may begin your conference. Uh, thank you, Sally, and uh, welcome everyone to the drought webinar. Uh, from snowy Kansas City today. I would like to uh, go ahead and introduce uh, Mr. Brian Fuchs from the National Drought Mitigation Center, and he will be presenting today's uh, Midwest and Great Plains Drought Update webinar. Brian, you've got the floor. All right. Thank you, John, and, and good day, everyone, and thank you for joining us today for another update on what's going on uh, across the Midwest and the, the Great Plains as far as the drought situation goes, and also going to talk about some of the impacts that we're experiencing right now. So, again, I'm with the National Drought Mitigation Center with the School of Natural Resources, and we're located at the University of Nebraska in Lincoln, Nebraska. Uh, next slide. That is what so there's some general information about uh, those that have uh, worked very hard to get these calls put together, and I'm not going to go through everyone's name, but there is a lot of people working towards this. Uh, the next call is going to be January 17th, and there's going to be some information shortly being sent out about registering for that. Uh, you can get to access to these webinars as well as uh, past webinars at two different locations, one from the Midwest Regional Climate Center and also one from the High Plains Regional Climate Center, and there's a couple URLs posted there. Uh, what we'll do is uh, the protocol is uh, I will go through uh, the presentation that I have today, and then at the end we will take any questions, and they will all go through the operator. Next slide. So the agenda for today's talk is I'm going to go over the current conditions, uh, really what's been going on through uh, the last several months. I'm going to briefly talk about some of the outlooks, including uh, the seasonal and uh, U.S. Uh, seasonal drought outlook. Again, we're going to talk about some of the impacts, and then we'll have some time for some questions at the end. Next slide. Okay, so to dig right into the current conditions, what's been going on here with uh, some of the statewide numbers between June and November? And what we can see through the region is uh, there's, there's a lot of orange and red colors associated with the precipitation on the left-hand panel. What that's telling us is uh, the precipitation has been below normal and even record driest in both Nebraska and Wyoming and looking at some of the numbers through Kansas, Missouri, Iowa, South Dakota, even Minnesota, uh, we're seeing that we're much below normal with, with uh, some of these rankings out of 118 records in, in the, the driest 10 uh, events ever. Now as you go a little bit further to the east, you hit Illinois and, and into Indiana and into Ohio, even Kentucky, and with some uh, precipitation that has occurred through the fall and in, into uh, the first part of winter here, uh, those numbers do improve a little bit. And we see that those rankings are just slightly below normal to near normal in some of those instances. So uh, we're going to hit on those a little bit later in the, in the talk. And not only has it been dry in some of these locations, but on the right-hand panel you can also see how temperatures have also been a key player in how drought has been developing and, uh, and spreading through the region. Uh, definitely some, some dryness as well as some heat uh, from the June through November time frame through the central Rockies and into the Great Basin where we have four states showing the record, record warmest time frame for that uh, uh, region. And then as we go into uh, the High Plains region, we see anywhere uh, from 
uh, South Dakota to Nebraska uh, in the 104th, the 108th uh, warmest out of 118 uh, records. And then as you go further to the east again, associated with some of those precipitation events, we did see some cooler temperatures, especially through the month of October. And we can see that uh, some of these areas were below normal in, in the Kentucky to West Virginia area and right near normal through Ohio, Indiana, and Illinois. So uh, it's quite the contrast from west to east as, as you go through the region. Next slide. And specifically looking at uh, some of these numbers uh, at the climate division level, you can see the climate divisions that did have the record driest uh, uh, June through November periods in the dark reds, and then the much below normals are in the orange. And, and so you can really uh, highlight here Nebraska really stands out as well as portions of, uh, of uh, Wyoming and into southern Mo Minnesota and Montana that uh, these areas were record dry, dry uh, events that uh, uh, with 118 years of values, uh, this, this last year is really standing out. Again, as you go further east of the region, you can start to see that transition in Iowa and then western Illinois as we have the much below to below normal conditions associated with these climate division precipitation numbers. Next slide. And then looking at the November data specifically, we can see that those warm temperatures were uh, very uh, evident all the way through the Rocky Mountains and even into the, the Plain States. And as you go further east, those temperatures definitely uh, started to, to uh, level out and, and were more near normal. Definite uh, cold pattern through the east coast through the month of November. Uh, then if you start looking at precipitation on the right-hand panel, again, even with the precipitation that was observed through the region, uh, still much below normal to uh, below normal for almost the entire High Plains and Midwest regions, and uh, starting to see some of the uh, uh, areas that uh, did pick up some precipitation through uh, September and October that kind of ended here in November. But climatologically, as we go into uh, November and also December, uh, the, the amounts of precipitation start to decline as well. So those deficits don't uh, as accumulate as quickly as, as in other months. Next slide. And this is the last 30 days of uh, information coming out of the ACES system and with the precipitation on the left and the temperatures on the right. And you can see that uh, for most everything that's in, in red on the precipitation image, that's less than an inch and a half of precipitation. So if you want to generalize the region as a whole, you can say that almost every spot was below an inch and a half of precipitation over the last 30 days. And there are some pockets within uh, Missouri and Illinois that were in that inch and a half to three inch range and even a few uh, scattered up in Minnesota, but uh, generally speaking, uh, uh, fairly dry over the last 30 days. And then temperatures as well stayed quite elevated for this time of year, except for uh, uh, up in uh, the Dakotas, uh, especially at the border of North Dakota and, and and uh, Canada, and even those values were still right at normal to slightly above normal over the last 30 days for temperatures. But uh, you can see these, uh, the average is going to be in that 6 to 8 degrees Fahrenheit above normal throughout that time frame, and this is extending all the way through the central Rockies, uh, all the way into Ohio and Indiana as well to our south, uh, to Texas. So it isn't isolated to one region. But again, you can see that these areas correlate well with uh, uh, where we've also seen the dry conditions. Next slide. And just the, the last 30-day SPI, you know, sometimes it's, it's hard to get a, a good perspective on what does that inch and a half of precipitation mean uh, for an area when you just look at that departure or percent of normal. The SPI gives a, a little bit better indication of areas that were wet over this time frame and were dry over this time frame. And you can see in the greens, those were some positive SPIs, so that's, that's falling on the wetter side of the curve where you see the oranges and yellows, those are right at normal to slightly below normal uh, through the last 30 days. And, and in this image here, Colorado and Wyoming, western Nebraska really stand out as well as portions of eastern Kansas where the SPIs during the last 30 days are in that uh, minus 1 to minus 1.5 range, which is quite dry. Next slide. 
and the 12 month uh, departure from normal precipitation. I just wanted to throw this slide out there to show that even with uh, some of the, the gains that we've made in, in portions of uh, the central to eastern Corn Belt, uh, the eastern portions of the Midwest over the last uh, few months, uh, there are some deficits that are quite large that exist over the last 12 months. And if you look at that area around western Kentucky, southern Illinois, southwest Missouri, we're still talking anywhere from 12 to 16, even approaching 20 inches below normal over the last uh, 12 months. Uh, if you think back to where we were last year at this time, that's really where we started seeing the dryness developing was, was in that same region. So even with the gains that they've made over the last uh, three to four months, some of these areas are still substantially dry, drier than what they should be and these deficits just don't get made up in, in a hurry. And you can look at uh, areas of Oklahoma, eastern Kansas, through much of central Nebraska, 12 to 16 inches below normal is quite uh, uh, commonplace in those areas. And as you go east into Iowa, 8 to 12 inches is more commonplace with some pockets of drier readings and even into Illinois. And so just to really point out that over the last 12 months, uh, uh, we have been in a very dry pattern. It's not surprising with the, the drought situation that we've been discussing through much of the summer and into the fall that we're seeing these numbers still, that uh, the short-term recovery in some of these places is still uh, going to be offset by these longer-term deficits. And we've really, and we're going to talk about this a little bit uh, later in the call, but the hydrology in these regions are really showing just how dry it has been. Uh, next slide. And what we talk about uh, during the autumn time here is this fall recharge. And I know uh, on the last call, Dennis uh, spoke about this a little bit in that uh, we, we really look at the soil temperatures this time of year and how soon they freeze up. And up until the point where they do freeze up, we can recharge those soils with some moisture if we get precipitation. Well, uh, one thing we've noticed is with those warmer temperatures, the soils have for the most part stayed open through this time frame, but uh, quite the contrast from west to east as far as precipitation goes. If you look at uh, uh, areas in Nebraska, over the, and this is the last 90 days for, for the, the product that I'm showing, which is basically from the end of the growing season to current, uh, most of these places are well below an inch of precipitation uh, and more, more so of uh, less than two inches almost through the entire uh, western port parts of the region from uh, uh, Kansas, Nebraska, the Dakotas into Montana and Wyoming and Colorado. So even though we've had those soils that have stayed unfrozen during this time frame, there has been very little, if any, recharge in this region. Now, as you go east uh, into Iowa and, and places further to the east, uh, there has been a little bit more precipitation. By the time you get to central Iowa, uh, you're talking three and a half inches of, of moisture during the last 90 days. And then into Illinois, Indiana, Ohio, you're talking anywhere from six and a half to eight inches. Even down into Kentucky, some of approaching eight to nine and a half inches. What that means is there has been some recharge taking place on the, the shallower depths of the soil, meaning the topsoil. Uh, depending on the, the type of soil in the region and also other factors that are in place, uh, there, ha there may be some better soil moisture uh, in, those, uh, top, in the top foot of the, the profile as we go into the winter and these soils freeze up. What that means is going into fall, or excuse me, going into uh, spring next year, some of these areas are going to be sitting a little bit better, agriculturally speaking, as we, uh, we start thinking about what the 2013 ag season is going to look like. Uh, what, what I will caution, though, is even with uh, some of this recharge that did take place, the deeper depths of the soil uh, did not uh, see that replenishment at all. Most of this was taking place on, on that uh, first foot of, of soil, generally speaking. And there, of course, there's going to be some local variances to the region. Uh, looking at the next slide now is just one of the soil moisture models that we look at. Hey, Brian. Yes. Uh, this is Doug. I, I really apologize for, uh, for interrupting. Um, if the operator is listening in, can you make sure or ask somebody who is not one of the presenters whether they can see the, the, the maps? If they can, great. If they, or, or the presentation. If, if can, great. Otherwise, um, uh, we have a little issue. 
Ladies and gentlemen, if you can see the webinar, please press star 1 on your telephone keypad. Okay, I am going to open up the line. One moment, please. Your line is now open. Are you able to see the webinar? Who are you talking to? Uh, whoever whoever uh, pressed star 1. This yeah. is Richard Heim, NCDC. I can see the webinar. Okay. Uh, no problem. Okay, thank you so much, Richard. Uh, sorry to bother everybody. Sorry to you, Brian, for interrupting. I was I was having some issues, and I was wondering if anybody else was too. Thank you. Okay, are, are we ready to continue then? If you uh, could press pound to withdraw, please. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, what we were discussing was the fall recharge. And what I wanted to show with, with uh, this with this slide was the precipitation over the last uh, thirty, or excuse me, ninety days. And then on the next slide, I want we can go to the next slide. And this is one of the the soil moisture models that we do use. Uh, this is from the NLDAS, and this is the total column soil moisture percentile. Uh, it is a few days old, so it's not incorporating uh, the most current data. But uh, what you can see from this is uh, the areas where we, you know lack of recharge is, is is highly noted, and you can see in Minnesota, parts of the Dakotas definitely in Nebraska, definitely in Oklahoma, Texas Panhandle, eastern New Mexico, into Kansas. These areas are still showing, and this is the total column of soil, that this is going into the deepest depths, that we're only showing uh, uh, the moisture levels at the second to fifth percentile, still very dry. And we talked about, uh, as we went east through the region into the Midwest, you can see that it, going into uh, Ohio and Kentucky, uh, some of these areas are showing uh, uh, moisture levels right in the normal areas with pockets of dryness. And even in Illinois, you can see the, ch the changes that uh, into central I Illinois uh, compared to northern Illinois where there's still some deficits being shown. And again, this is modeled information, but it is one of the, the better products out there as far as showing this. What's this meaning? Well, going into uh, the winter, uh, the recharge period for much of the region, especially in the Central Plains area, was, was not very good, meaning that even with ideal moisture through the winter months and even ideal moisture going into the first part of spring, those agricultural concerns in the region as well as hydrological concerns are going to have deficits to deal with with uh, the lack of moisture in the soil and that, that will continue to be an issue without recharge. Going on to the next slide. Uh, current snow cover. Uh, as John mentioned on, on the call, that uh, there was a little snow in Kansas City, and we picked up some snow here in Lincoln as well. It was our first snowfall in over 309 days uh, for our area, so that's showing us uh, for one, that this uh, winter is already a contrast to what we saw last winter with, with it being very mild and dry for much of the region and, and snow-free. And you can see that uh, with the storm that went through last night and is continuing to push eastward, that uh, some of these areas did pick up some snow all the way down into uh, the Oklahoma panhandle in uh, central Kansas. And we can see also through the Rocky Mountains that some of these areas are starting to pick up some snowfall now after a fairly quiet start to the snow season. And the Pacific Northwest is continually getting hit with uh, these storm systems as they're coming to shore. So uh, encouraging to see this. It is going to reflect in our temperatures over the next several days as long as we do keep the snowpack. So uh, just wanted to make note of that. Next slide. So here we are with the current U.S. Drought Monitor. I was the author for this week and uh, put the map together. Uh, realistically, for the U.S., uh, not a lot of changes this week or over the last several weeks. Uh, 
Uh, some of the changes that were made in the region I'll highlight on the next slide, but you're still seeing over 60% of the U.S. is in drought, which is a very substantial amount. And this number has wavered anywhere from 60 to 65% over the last six months or so. So realistically, not a lot of changes. What we have noticed is some of the drought that we were experiencing in the eastern part of the Midwest has improved to some degree, and we are showing uh, that improvement on the map, but we also have seen drought issues developing further west and into the northern part of the Rocky Mountains, into Montana and Wyoming and parts of the Great Basin during that same time frame. So even though those numbers have uh, stayed about the same over the last few months, the uh, areas of drought have definitely uh, migrated from east to west a little bit. Next slide. Some statistics associated with uh, this week's map, and I have a few uh, numbers highlighted on the bottom half of the panel. Uh, last year at this time, the U.S. as a whole was only seeing 28 percent of the country in drought, and that compares to about 62 percent with this week's drought monitor. Uh, three months ago, we were at about 65 percent. Start of the calendar year, we were about 28.5 uh, percent. And back in October, at the start of the water year, we're at 65 percent. So you can really see since October to now, not really a lot of change. Uh, one thing to note also on that D4 column, currently we're at 6.64 percent of the country in D4. And that compares to a year ago where 4.59 percent of uh, the country was in D4. Much of that was isolated in the southern plains at that point where much of the D4 we're seeing now is in the central plains and in the Midwest region. Next slide. And here's a regional uh, view of, of the U.S. Drought Monitor for today's release as well. And it, it really shows uh, the highlight of the region, what's going on. Definitely Nebraska is not only the epicenter of, of drought in the country, but also here in the region. And some of the neighboring states are not too far behind as far as their drought intensity. Uh, currently, we're seeing about 69% of the region is in drought, and that compares to 79% three months ago. Much of that improvement, again, was made in the areas on the eastern edge of the, the Midwest through Ohio, Kentucky, Indiana, and Illinois, as, as we've seen drought expand in other regions as well. Uh, this week, I did expand some of the D3 in Wyoming. Uh, even though they have started to see some higher elevation precipitation with some decent snowpack, the lower elevations have remained quite dry and even a new area of D4 in the southwest part of the state near Rock Springs where they have uh, just continually missed out on, on precipitation in that part of Wyoming. Also for this week, we uh, pushed uh, some of the D2 and D3 conditions and expanded them in southern Montana. Uh, really some good coordination with the, the state uh, drought task force up in Montana with those changes this week. And on the eastern edge of the, the region in Kentucky, I eliminated an area of D0 in the north central part of the state near Lexington. And other than that, I think that was the only changes that were made in the Midwest and in High Plains this week. Uh, some discussion did come up uh, late yesterday about some hydrology issues in northwestern Missouri. Uh, some uh, stock ponds and, and uh, uh, lake levels are fairly dry. And the comment that was made was maybe we pulled the extreme drought out of northwest Missouri a little too soon. So that is something for uh, folks on this call to be considering uh, going forward and, and maybe with uh, some of the precipitation over uh, the last 24 hours, maybe that has helped to ease some of those concerns a little bit. But uh, just an area to make note in the region uh, that was brought up to me when I was doing the map. Uh, next slide. Now we're going to go into uh, some of the outlooks here for uh, the short term as well as the seasonal level. So for the next five days, I'm going to start with the precipitation panel on the lower left. And we can see the system that uh, came through the central plains yesterday continues to push east and northeast into the region. And uh, some decent precipitation amounts associated with that, uh, maybe up to two inches right up in the uh, upper uh, portions of Wisconsin and the UP of Michigan, as well as into New York. 
uh, looking like uh, maybe a good inch through Indiana and Ohio and Kentucky associated with this and maybe even some further uh, and some uh, amounts similar further to the south. And then also I want to highlight on the west coast and the next storm system that's going to be impacting us is starting to move ashore during this time frame. And uh, we are seeing uh, some, some heavy precipitation amounts associated with these as they continually move ashore in Oregon and Northern California. So a couple things to consider with this is going to be storm track and timing and just how quickly these systems are being ejected onto the plains and into the Midwest. And that's really going to be what we're going to be looking at over the next week or so. Temperatures associated during this time frame in the upper right panel, you can see that with that snowpack, temperatures are expected to be below normal, anywhere from 3 to 6 degrees Fahrenheit below normal, or right at uh, seasonal temperatures through the eastern edges of the, of the Midwest. Uh, some colder air trying to make its way out of Canada up in uh, North Dakota and Montana as well. Next slide. The 8 to 14, I'm going to start with the upper right and look at temperatures as well. As we uh, saw at the end of the five-day period and going into the 8 to 14, that cold air is trying to keep its working its way out of uh, Canada and into the U.S. And during the 8 to 14, much of the U.S. is, is showing better than normal chances of below normal temperatures during this time frame, uh, especially over the northern Rockies in that region there. Uh, so, again, the, with the snowpack that we have received and we're expecting to receive during the, the next uh, week or so, uh, this, this forecast looks like it has a very good uh, chance of verifying. Again, looking at the precipitation now in the lower left-hand panel, there are several areas with above normal chances of above normal precipitation during this time. Uh, again, as these storms are coming on to the California coast and ejecting into the southwest, before they make their way onto the plains and Midwest. There has been uh, quite a bit of precipitation associated with them, and we're expecting to see that again through the 8 to 14 day period. It looks like uh, some of the upper Midwest regions of the Great Lakes are showing some above normal chances for above normal precipitation. But all in all, most of the high plains in the Midwest uh, is showing a better than a better chance of above normal precipitation during this time. So an active pattern to end uh, the year here. Next slide. And the seasonal products as well. The, the uh, January through March time frame on the lower half of the panel and then the January outlook on the top half of the panel. We're looking at uh, temperatures on the left and precipitation on the right. Uh, for temperatures, we're continuing to see that cold signal building into uh, the northern part of the U.S. with uh, uh, fairly good chances of above normal, or excuse me, below normal temperatures through uh, North Dakota and Montana and into Minnesota. Uh, we see equal chances really dominating much of the high plains and Midwest uh, during the month of January. Uh, with with that in mind, you know, looking at our seasonal temperatures for this time of year, uh, we're not talking any uh, significant warm-up by any means. Uh, precipitation for January, again, it looks like uh, the active pattern through the Pacific Northwest uh, stays in place. And we have some uh, different areas for uh, better than normal chances of above normal uh, precipitation through Minnesota, Wisconsin, and the upper peninsula of Michigan, as well as in the southeast. So we'll have to watch those areas. Now for the seasonal period, January through March, it looks like uh, uh, even with the lack of an El Nino signal, uh, we're seeing that warmer than normal uh, temperatures uh, going over the, the southern half of the U.S. and some cooler than normal temperatures expected over the northern uh, reaches of uh, Montana and North Dakota during this time frame. So we'll have to really watch and see how this plays out, and I think snowpack is going to play an important role in this. The areas that we do see that snowpack, if we can maintain it, it is going to do something to temperatures during that time frame. Uh, for precipitation on the right-hand side, uh, some of those areas of western Kentucky, uh, southern Illinois, southwest Missouri, uh, they're showing a fairly decent signal for uh, above normal chances of above normal precipitation during uh, the next three months as well as in uh, some of the areas of uh, Idaho and Montana. Uh, equal chances for much of the rest of the region, and with it being a fairly dry time of year, even those above normal 
uh, chances of above normal precipitation. That does not mean that uh, uh, we're going to be expecting a tremendous amount of moisture with that because it is a fairly dry time of year. Next slide. And there was a new seasonal drought outlook that was released today as well. Uh, you see a lot of uh, dark reds and browns on this map, and that's that persistence of where drought is going to maintain itself. Uh, with, the, with it being this time of year and knowing just how dry the, the winter months are, it's not too surprising to see this, especially through the Plain States and into portions of the Midwest. Uh, so we're looking at drought persisting through the winter into the, the first part of spring from uh, most locations from central Iowa and Minnesota to the west. We are looking at some opportunities for continual improvement through uh, the central Midwest to the eastern portions of the Midwest and looking at uh, some of those areas of uh, the northern Rockies may be seeing some improvement as well just depending on those storm tracks again as those storms start uh, uh, coming into the Pacific Northwest. All in all, Again, uh, this persistence has been very evident over the last several releases of the U.S. Seasonal Drought Outlook. Uh, we've seen some of that wavering on the eastern uh, edges of the improvement. Uh, sometimes it, it, it is being, it's being shown a little more pronounced than others, so we're just going to have to wait and see. Again, this is winter. We don't expect to receive a lot of precipitation during these months, but anything we do receive is going to be helpful moving forward. Next slide. Briefly, we're going to talk about some of the impacts that we're seeing. Uh, for the most part, we've really hammered on some of the agricultural impacts that we've experienced through the Plains and Midwest with this drought episode in 2012. And just because the end of the growing season has, has approached and we're into winter, that does not mean that the impacts are going away. And many of the problems that we are seeing associated with the dryness have been uh, on the hydrologic side. And that's what we're going to discuss here with the next several slides. So uh, some of the hydrological impacts that we're experiencing are being well publicized in, in the media, and that's the low flows on both the Missouri and the Mississippi rivers. And this here is uh, the forecast for the Mississippi River at St. Louis and where we expect it to be by the middle of January. And it looks like uh, that purple line is showing the continual decline uh, during that time frame. And if you go to the next slide, we're going to put that into some perspective. Uh, the forecast for the middle of January is showing the Mississippi at, at this location to be at a minus 5.7 feet. And if you look at the, uh, the rankings, this is going to rank right up near the top. But you also look at some of the, the readings that are, are, are worse on this ranking scale, and those were prior to uh, regulation and the, the mainstream system being completely finished in 1967. So the one year that this is comparable to is 1989 following a significant drought on in the Midwest region where the Mississippi reached a minus 5.32 feet about uh, this time of year back in 89. But uh, what we're seeing is uh, we're already going to be surpassing that. Uh, even with some of the mitigation techniques that are being used with some water releases. So uh, definitely seeing the, the impact on the Mississippi River, and it's going to be uh, reaching some historic lows. Next slide. And why, how, how can we put this into perspective? And this is a good indication. This is looking at the precipitation uh, north of Memphis from January through November 1895 through 2012. And this is, is uh, giving you an idea of just where the precipitation is. You know, the, the uh, average is right around 27, or the mean, excuse me, is right at 27 inches. And during this time frame, and this is, again, all, the entire basin above uh, Memphis, we're at uh, 22 inches for this year. You can just see that uh, there are not very many years uh, that approach where we have been for 2012 as far as uh, uh, the amount of precipitation above, uh, above Memphis. So you can see that this uh, dryness is on top of some years where we had substantial precipitation. We were well above the mean. So uh, this is an anomaly, but it is almost the outlier as well because of just how extreme it has been. Next slide. 
and this was uh, forwarded on to me yesterday that the, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers St. Louis District began increasing releases from Carlisle Lake yesterday, which was 1219, in support of safe navigation on the Mississippi River. And there's also been some work being done on some of these channels to uh, help clear them of debris to make them more uh, easier to navigate and to uh, have some safer barge traffic as well. So there are some uh, techniques being done as far as water releases and, and cleanup of these channels to help uh, keep these uh, uh, channels open uh, for, for commerce. Next slide. And to talk about the Missouri River Basin as well, uh, looking at uh, the snowpack uh, for the basin right now. and. You can look at the total above Fort Peck and also the total from Fort Peck to Garrison. And what you can see is uh, they have two different years as far as uh, what they have identified as the max and the min. Uh, and the, the maximum is uh, 1997 in purple, and the minimum was 2001 in green. And what, what they're showing on this is uh, uh, the 81 to 2010 average in red. And then in blue is where we're currently at. So what you can see is we are we were quite a ways below, uh, and I'm looking at the above Fort Peck uh, graphic right now. We were quite a wa quite a ways below uh, what we were seeing in 2001 until recently, where we've seen uh, some of these uh, uh, areas picking up some some snowpack, and we've finally approached that average line on on uh, the areas above Fort Peck, as well as in Garrison. It, they weren't as bad as far as being uh, uh, around the anomaly low for the period in that Fort Peck to Garrison region, uh, but we are showing that they're, they're at least hitting the average right now. And after last year, that's a, a welcome sign, and especially after the slow start to the snow season so far, that uh, we have bumped this up here recently. And even a, a year where we're going to approach that, uh, that average curve is going to be welcome after how dry it was last year. Next slide. And again, this is showing the Missouri River Basin precipitation uh, like I showed for the Mississippi River. And again, you can see that 2012 is the outlier, and it's only approached by a few years in the late 30s that uh, were even remotely close to this. And again, this comes off of several years of above normal precipitation for the basin, but then we, at the bottom just fell out, and we were seeing uh, mostly six to seven inches below normal average average and commonplace throughout the basin. Next slide. And this is the, the runoff forecast above Sioux City for the Missouri River Basin. As of December 1st, the annual runoff is expected to be 19.7 million acre feet, and this is compared to an average of 24.8 million acre feet, so still a decline even as we are starting to approach uh, that average curve for this time of year. Uh, these can change, though. You know, we are early in the snow season, and it has been a slow start, but the pattern is, is starting to be a little bit more favorable to uh, accumulating snows uh, in the Rocky Mountains and especially in the Missouri River Basin and the headwaters up in Montana. So we'll have to watch this and see uh, what, what it brings over the next couple months as far as uh, this forecast. But right now we're almost at uh, 20 mil 20 million acre feet for the year. Next slide. So the summary, uh, drought conditions will persist through the region over the next three months. Uh, this is solidified not only by the climatology of the region, but also the indicators that we're looking at uh, for the long range forecast coming out of CPC or the Climate Prediction Center. Uh, as we go into winter, hydrologic impacts will continue. We're seeing some definite water shortages on, on the mainline rivers and streams in the region, and this is going to continue. Uh, outside of some very significant snowstorms with some winter melt, uh, we're not going to see much change to this uh, uh, over the next several months. Uh, near record low flows will continue on both the Missouri and Mississippi rivers. This is going to continue to cause problems with not only shipping, but also uh, some, some water supply issues in these areas as well. Uh, no indications in the seasonal forecast of any significant pattern changes through the winter. 
it looks like on the short term here that we are seeing uh, at least a more active weather pattern through the Plains and Midwest region that will uh, bring us some snowfall here through the end of the year. But moving forward, the, the seasonal forecast does not show that uh, uh, any significant uh, uh, precipitation anomalies are, are going to be expected during this time. So uh, with that, I think I have one more slide. There's some uh, further information associated with these calls uh, where the presentations are being recorded, uh, some data information from various agencies, and one more slide. My contact information along with my phone number. Again, my name is Brian Fuchs with the National Drought Mitigation Center, and we'll send it over to the operator to bring up questions. Uh, Brian, could you go back to slide number two? Um, that has information on where to go get this uh, recording, as well as well as where to get the PDF of these presentations. And, it's, and it also announces the next one of these of the series, which is Jan January seventeenth, which is Thursday again, at one p.m. Central Standard Time. So, John, if you want to take that all the way back to the second slide, that information is on there. At this time, I would like to remind everyone, in order to ask a question, press star, then the number one on your telephone keypad. We'll pause for just a moment to compile the Q&A roster. Your first question comes from the line of Sue Lowry. Your line is now open. OK, thank you. Um, could you go to the slide? I think it was four from the end. Um, it had the year 2012 up in the title. Oh, I'm sorry, 2012. Yeah, that's the correct one. Um, Brian, and maybe I was just a little confused when you were talking about this one. So you were talking about the, the conditions that we've seen thus far in December of, of this year, so the month we're in now. So is this graphic reflecting what we've seen for calendar year 12? This, the forecast came out as a, as a December 1st, so I'm... I am not 100% sure, but I'm guessing that the December data is not incorporated into this product yet. More so, I was focusing on the runoff projections as of December 1. Okay, so up in the little gray box. Yes. What is that telling me, I guess? That's telling us that right now, the forecast runoff above Sioux City on the Missouri River is forecasted to be 19.7 million acre feet of runoff. And that is compared to a historical average of 24.8 million acre feet of runoff for that same region. So basically that is a decline uh, from below the historical a annual runoff that is currently being forecasted based on current conditions in the basin. Okay, so as of December 1st, the forecast of 19.7 million acre feet is for what time period? For the annual runoff. And, and actually, uh, Bill Doan, if, if you're on, can you verify those, what Brian is saying? No, Brian's right on. Uh, it's for the calendar year, January 2012 to December 2012. Thank you. So uh, 11 of those months are actually true values, and we forecast their December values. So. It should be pretty accurate, 19.7. Okay, great. I... All right, that's, that's clear now. Thank you. All right, thank you. Your next question comes from the line of Nolan Duskin. Your line is now open. Can you bring up the ML DAS soil moisture uh, product again? Seemed like there were some interesting discrepancies and I've, I've never become a true expert at using that product in, in comparing it to the to the uh, uh, final US drop monitor map it seemed like there were some substantial discrepancies in Kansas yeah yeah that West Central Kansas is dry but not so bad and if you then go to the 
the drought monitor for that same area, some of that is still, did show some improvement, but not far yet from, yeah, it's still all in D3 in that same area. Is that a, a common kind of discrepancy, or or is, is that a, an area of, of that needs closer look? Well, with with the drought monitor, the NL DAS is, is one indicator of many that, that we're looking at. So there could be other signals that are more prominent in that region one way or the other that is uh, dictating why it isn't, uh, why one area is showing uh, the relationship better to, to what NLDAS is showing compared to others. But you're definitely finding that NLDAS product as your as one of your favorites for representing soil moisture? With, with what I, when I'm doing the map, and, and I, I cannot speak for all the authors, when, when I'm looking at the NLDAS products, I'm looking at uh, the, the two, the, the total column, as well as, um, I can't remember what they titled the other one. It's the more shallow, shallower uh, reading. And then I'm also looking at the, the VIC products from University of Washington, as well as their multi-model ensembles, as well as the CPC uh, leaky bucket model. So the NLDAS, because of the, the uh, gridded approach and, and the, the resolution that it provides, has become more of a favorite. But I won't say that it uh, is always performing <laughs> ideally. You know, it, again, until we have real soil moisture monitoring, um, we're left to uh, these tools that are, at, uh, at are available to us. Yeah, I really pre appreciate your perspective on that. And, and, and the one thing I'll, I'll mention since we brought up soil moisture is that uh, uh, we really don't have uh, a lot of monitoring of real soil moisture data and that these models uh, are often, um, not, they're a national models, so it's not really showing uh, as accurately as possible what's going on. Nolan, this is Dennis. The other thing you might want to consider here, too, is the NLDAS as listed there as a percentile. Yep. And when you're looking at percentiles for this time of year, you're talking about drier than generally dry anyway. So it's it's a subtle point. Yeah. You're in the 20th to 30th percentile during a time of year when it's probably pretty dry anyway. Right. Thank you. Again, if you would like to ask a question, press star one on your telephone keypad. Your next question comes from a line whose information hasn't been gathered. Please state your first and last name. Your line is now open. I hope you're referring to me, Richard Heim, National Climatic Data Center. And I have a couple comments and a question. Uh, I'm also a U.S. Drought Monitor author, so I'll start by noting that for the NLDAS model, um, it is a good one. It has a number of good qualities. There is one issue I have with it. It's about three days behind. It's, it's timeliness. It's not as good as I prefer. So it's just one of, of the several soil moisture models that Brian mentioned that I use as well. The second comment is concerning the Mississippi and Missouri River Basin graphs. You showed 2012, January to November, precipitation, third lowest. The lowest is 1936, the second lowest is 1934. So we're talking uh, precipitation deficits in these basins of the Dust Bowl 1930s magnitude. The question I had is the um, Mississippi River stream flow rankings pre-regulation and post-regulation 2000, yes, that one, 2012, or at least this forecast for 2013, third lowest behind these 1940 and 1963 values, which are pre-regulation values. And um, the question was, if the Mississippi River had no regulation, where would 2012 be in comparison to those 1940 and 1963 values? 
I don't think we have the person on that can answer that, but um, I'll certainly open it up to Bill or Kevin or anybody else on this panel that would like to discuss that. You know, this is Bill, and you know, like, that's outside of our uh, kind of uh, area, so I'm just not certain. Yeah, we pretty much see on the Missouri River. Uh, this is Kevin from Missouri Basin. I would guess that we would be lower without regulation by a smidge. Um, I believe the Missouri is contributing more, uh, given the fact that we've got Gavin's up there today. But that's just a, that's a guess on my part. Thank you. Again, if you'd like to ask a question, that is star one on your telephone keypad. Your next question comes from the line of Paul Lepesto. Your line is now open. Thank you, and thank you very much for the update again. Uh, very good information. One question, uh, you said that there's some water being released from Lake Carlisle, but did not identify where Lake Carlisle is. I, I'm not familiar with the reservoir. Hello? Brian? Yeah, I, I'm not familiar as well. I It was forwarded to me yesterday, and I did not look, have the chance to look up the information on that lake. This is this is Colleen Callahan. I'm uh, from Illinois, and Carlisle Lake is in Illinois. Uh, actually uh, created by the Army Corps of Engineers years ago for uh, use as a water reservoir. So it's in Illinois. How large is the reservoir and how long can that uh, those withdrawals go from there before there's negative impacts on that lake and the water that it supplies? Well, it's an appropriate question, one that I don't have the capability of, of answering. Uh, but I, I did attend uh, a meeting this week where the Army Corps was in attendance in, in East Alton, and um, I can get my notes out. Uh, it, it's a it's a very minimal uh, amount of, of water that can be released, um, and it was the only um, reservoir and the only opportunity left. Uh, in which to continue to add uh, water for the Mississippi River flow. Uh, I'm not an authority on that, uh, but uh, as we see, uh, reaching for my notes from then, and I um, find that in my notes, I will jump back on with what the Army Corps indicated on Monday. Thanks for the information. You've yes. already provided me with more than I knew before. <laughs> okay, well, I'll provide you with a little more here in a couple minutes. And just to add some information for the folks on the call today, I, I ran some numbers for the current U.S. drought monitor, and I looked at both the Missouri Basin as well as the upper and lower Mississippi basins, and I have some statistics as far as the percentage of, of those basins in drought currently. For the Missouri River Basin, we're at 82% of the basin is in drought as of uh, today's release of the map. On the Mississippi, the upper portion of the basin, 82% uh, of that uh, reach is in drought. The lower, which is huck number eight, is only at 17.85% in drought. If you combine the upper and lower together for the Mississippi, we're right at 60% of the basin in drought. So contributing to the Mississippi, it's more in the upper reach. Uh, versus the lower, and then the Missouri is about 82% of the basin is in drought, according to the U.S. Drought Monitor as of today. Yes, this, this is Colin Callahan again. Um, the Carlisle uh, Lake Reservoir was discussed, uh, and the Army Corps indicated on Monday, as I look at my notes, that uh, in the St. Paul area that those reservoirs uh, have already been tapped, uh, already used, and there is one remaining. So uh, that is Red Rock, uh, and my understanding is that Red Rock is in the uh, somewhere uh, in Iowa, uh, and the notation I have is that there is a modest amount available that could still be released from Red Rock in the amount of 2,000 cubic feet per second. Um, 
and other than that, that that is the last remaining body of water that could be tapped into to provide any additional flow following the Carlisle Lake usage. Your next question comes to the line of Jim Angel. Your line is now open. Yeah, hi. Uh I was just going to add to the Carlisle discussion. I think what they did was uh, they actually ran the reservoir on the high side, and, and I think it's like I think it's like two or three feet above its normal winter pool. So they purposely held the water back this fall, and then they're going to release that down and get it back down to the normal winter pool, whatever level that is, and then and then shut it off. So it'll be I think it's a couple of weeks of of supply and. Of course, it runs down the Kaskaskia River, so it, it actually enters the Mississippi uh, south of St. Louis there uh, around St. Genevieve and Chester in that area. So it's it's kind of a short-term temporary solution. I think, I think one discussion I heard, it was going to raise the, the river about six inches for about three or four weeks, and then they would run out of water. Yeah, and I, I do have the Army Corps. Uh, contact information from the individuals who participated that I met. If anyone would like to uh, have that information, I'd be glad to submit it. Uh, and you could contact um, the captain directly. There are no further questions at this time. I turn the call back over to the presenters. Uh, I'll, I'll just say thank you to uh, Brian for doing a great job and this panel for uh, being able to answer some of the, or being available to answer the questions and everybody else who's been on uh, participating and listening in. Um, like I said, the next uh, present or yeah, the next uh, webinar will be January 17th. We hope to have several more snowstorms, even though that's an inconvenience between now and then, uh, to alleviate some of these things. But um, I guess I'm, at that point, John, do you have anything else you'd like to say? Nothing I can think of at the moment, except uh, we will probably have this ready to go online in the next day or so. So, And uh, we appreciate everyone joining us today and for all of us here at the National Weather Service and uh, at the National Drought Mitigation Center, thank you for joining us today. This concludes today's conference call. You may now disconnect.